Good morning. Before I read scripture, I'd like to ask if there are any here who have prayer concerns that they would like to share with the church family. The scripture that I'll be sharing with you is from the gospel according to Matthew in chapter 25, and I'll be reading now verses 14 through 18. This is one of the parables, of course, that Jesus taught. He said, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another, two talents, and to another, one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. May God bless this reading of his holy word. May he bless it to our understanding. May he bless it to the way we live lives, both as individuals and as a church. Amen? Amen. My grandfather, my grandfather Ferris, was in the sawmill business. He was in that business for quite a few years. And this was back at the early 1900s, back when uh, trees were felled by men wielding axes and cross-cut saws. When those logs were hauled out of the woods, snaked out is the term that was used, by teams of oxen. And when the lumber was sawn on a, a mill powered by a steam engine, it was a lot of work. And, you know, we think about, you get the impression, the thought of a lumberjack and people in that line of work. You think of you know, big burly men. Granddaddy stood five foot four before he got old and stooped. <laughs> He said one of his ambitions that he never achieved was to weigh more than 135 pounds. Well, he, as I say, he was in that business for quite a, quite a few years. Eventually, he got out of it. And after he did, there was someone who uh, went down the road a few miles from him and, and started their own sawmill. But this fellow was having trouble with it. He couldn't get it to work correctly. So he sent one of his workers to come talk to Granddaddy. Then, Mr. Ferris, they, they want you to come down to the mill and, and see if you can help them get it working right. Well, as a Granddaddy had stomach trouble off and on all his life, and he was having stomach trouble then, and he just told the guy, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not well enough to come right now. The worker went back to the mill, told the owner. The owner sent him right back. Said, go tell Mr. Ferris that I'll pay him whatever he wants if he'll just come down and get my meal working correctly. So the worker went back. Again, Granddaddy turned him down. Went back and told the owner. This time the owner himself came to see Granddaddy. He said, Mr. Mr. Sam, if you'll just say you're coming, the mill will start working right. <laughs> Fact is, when you do something and you do it right and you do it well, word gets around. And that didn't just happen with my grandfather. It doesn't just happen with mill work like that. When you and when I do something, and when we do it right, and when we do it well, God knows about it. That's what this message is about. It's about us as a church doing, doing right, and doing well. Because when you do that, when you do that in ministry, you find that that ministry will increase It'll multiply. 
And when you, when you do what you love, and when Jesus has instilled that love in you, well, it may be hard work, but it'll, the work itself will bring a measure of rest. There will be rest for the weary. Now, Jesus in this passage was teaching about the end of the age and all they could expect. He told them that the timing of the, the, of the end of the age was unpredictable. But even though it was unpredictable, they needed to be prepared for whenever. And they were therefore to use all their capabilities, all their resources to be ready for it. He sets the stage in verse 14. He said, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Now, uh, that presupposes that this man that, that he's talking about was a person of great wealth. The, uh, none of the disciples had that. Some of them, like Matthew, might have been fairly well off, but none of them were Diddy Warbucks rich. Gosh, I guess I'm just dating myself, hadn't I? <laughs> That's from the old comic strip, Little Orphan Annie. Well, they may not have been rich, but they had contact with people who were rich. They knew how the other half lived. Then Jesus continued in verse 15. He said, to one he gave five talents of money to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Um, it was almost certainly not what they expected. You know, where you've got a, this rich person who has probably several homes, several houses, or he's going on a world cruise, whatever, the servants who would stay there would expect him to give them instructions. You know, things like uh, stay away from the wine cellar, eat cheap. Here's a list of jobs, chores, things that I expect to be accomplished when I get back home. Oh, and no parties while I'm out. How many of you here are parents? Once, years ago, 30 or so years ago, my wife and I went on a little vacation to the beach, took our youngest daughter, Michelle, you've met her, we took her with us. Our son wanted to stay home. <laughs> well, we went to the beach. We had a pretty good time. But then a, a big storm started blowing in, so we decided to come back up few days early, a couple of days early. We got there and noticed there were two or three cars parked in the parsonage. We walked in and our son looked like he had seen a ghost. And some of the two or three of the people there, we'll see you later, Sam. <laughs> Others drove up, saw us and drove on. He was planning a party. But that's not what this rich person, that's not the sort of instructions he gave them about not having any parties and all that sort of thing. Instead, he started doling out money to them. And I tell you, it was some kind of money that he distributed to them, a talent. A talent was 75 pounds, not ounces. 75 pounds of precious metal. It could be gold. could be silver. Now think about that a minute. You work for somebody and he says, I'm going to leave, here's money. And he gives you 75 pounds of silver. Not ounces. Pounds. 
or he gives you 150 pounds of silver, or he gives you 375 pounds of precious metal. And doesn't give you specific instructions about it. He just expects you to do what is right. Boy, that is some kind of responsibility, isn't it? Would you like that kind of responsibility? I don't think I would. But this man, he apparently was a very good judge of character because none of the three absconded with the money. None of them got plane reservations to go to some Caribbean country where there's no extradition treaty. We read instead, the man who had received the five talent, talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also, the one, the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who, man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. The first two guys, it says they put the money to work. It doesn't say what they did to put it to work. Uh, uh, the Greek word there, egazomai, I believe it is, it can mean, it has a variety of meanings. It can mean working with one's hands. It can refer to trade or commerce. It can mean a lot of things, but it really doesn't tell us how they put the money to work. It only tells us that the money was distributed according to the abilities of each of these three. By the way, talent. This parable right here is how that word talent transformed, evolved from meaning a, a measure of weight to the measure of one's giftedness. This, this parable right here is responsible for that. Well, servant number one and servant number two, they capitalized on what they were good at. And they had a 100% return on the money with which they were entrusted. But the third one, the third guy, he refused to take any risk. Now, back then, they had banks and they had bankers, but there was no FDIC. If the bank went bust or the owner of left in the middle of the night. Your money was just gone. And this fellow, he apparently didn't trust the bankers and the banks of his day and time. You know, it's not uncommon at different times for money to be devalued. In the Revolutionary War, the Congress issued paper money in values of from one-sixth of a dollar, kind of an odd sum, up to, I believe, 80 or or $100. After the war, that currency was devalued, first to by one part in a hundred, and eventually by one part in a thousand. That $100 bill you had wasn't worth much anymore. During the Civil War, both sides, north and south, issued fiat currency, currency which wasn't backed by gold or silver or anything like that. It was backed only by a promise to eventually pay it. I had a friend in South Virginia. Everett Taylor was his name. He told me that... Uh, his great-grandfather was an officer in the Confederate Army, and uh, he was paid, and said every month he sent almost all of that money back to his wife with instructions, buy every bit of land you can find. If it comes up for sale, buy it. 
war ended, he came home and he asked his wife, where were the deeds? She kind of looked at him kind of sheepishly and pulled out a trunk full of Confederate money and not the first land deed. Not everybody to trust banks. People who went lived through the, the Great Depression of the 1930s, often they didn't trust banks. Uh, I've read that something like 9,000 banks closed up, collapsed. And the people who had money in those banks, it was just gone. And the people who lived through that as I say, they didn't trust banks and bankers. Like one of our neighbors growing up, Joe and Lizzie German. I've mentioned the Germanies before, some of them. You went down to the Germany house. First thing, you got out of your car. First thing, you were met by a parcel of dogs barking and growling and snarling. But then when you opened the gate to go into Mr. and Miss Germany's front yard, those dogs left. And all you heard after that was of rattlesnakes. The summertime, Mr. Germany drove up and down the road in his old pickup truck, and he caught them. Had one of those poles with a loop on the end of it. He caught those snakes. Some of them he put in bird cages that he hung from trees in his yard. Some of them he put in great big old jars. I don't even know where he got them, but great big old jars and half buried them in his yard. Story was, he didn't trust banks. Some of his money was buried under some of those rattlesnakes. Nobody ever tried to find that. <laughs> well, this servant number three, he didn't trust banks either. How do you think that worked out for him? Number one and number two, those servants knew their capabilities and took the risk, and they did well with it. The third one, let's look at verses 19 through 23. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done good and faithful servants. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So far, so good, right? Then we get to 24 and 25. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said. I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you, the one talent. He played it safe, so he thought. He preserved what the master had given him. But what did the master say about it? Verse 26, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown 
and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The King James translates it as the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't want to be there. Do you? Well, from this passage, there are three things, three points. One, God has entrusted each one of us with talents. Not 75 pounds or 150 pounds or 375 pounds of precious metal, but talents is that word has came to mean. Ability. God has entrusted each one of us with certain abilities, certain talents. Second, he expects us to use those talents, not to gain money. You know, money to God is nothing but paving material. He expects us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a dead and dying world. He entrusted us with talents. He expects us to use those talents in sharing the good news. And third, he requires us to take risks. It's always risky to share Jesus Christ. There have been times in the past where people have shared Jesus and it has cost them their liberty. It's cost them their lives, their places in the world today where it will cost one's liberty and perhaps even one's life to share. What risk is it for us? Well, nothing like that. People may think we're some kind of a nut or a religious fanatic, that we're intolerant. They may even uh, reject us. Sharing Jesus has cost believers that, and it will in the future. I want you to notice something way back in verse 15. He gave the talents of money, one five, one two, one one talent, each according to, to his ability. Each according to his ability. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't have the same talents. We don't have the same abilities. God does not expect someone whose only gift is of teaching to become the next Billy Graham. God does not expect someone whose only talent is hospitality to suddenly be able to give as much as one who has that gift well if you have only one gift you're expected to use it but if you use try and do something outside your area of giftedness it's going to be tiring it's going to be wearisome God doesn't expect that. He does expect all of us to work together, to work together, each recognizing our talents in order to share the good news of Jesus Christ. 
with those, those around us. And when we do that, we find rest. You see, weariness, weariness often comes when a person works outside their area of giftedness. But when you work within that area, it's rewarding. And part of that rewarding is you can't wait to do more of it. Servant number one in this story. Servant number two in this story, they did more. They did it well. And it produced greater ministry opportunities. It's the same with us. When we do what we're good at, what we're gifted at, what our talents are, it opens further opportunities for ministry. And th th this is kind of counterintuitive. You'd think the more you do, the more weary, the more tired, the more exhausted you get. But it's not that way. When you do and do more, and it's what you're gifted at, and it's what you love, you find rest within doing that ministry. It has to start with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship of salvation, a relationship when you trust Jesus and ask him into your life to be your Lord, and your Savior. And then you recognize what your gifts are and you put them to work regardless of the risk. At whatever point in your life you're at, whether it's at the point of, of never having asked Him into your life or whether it's the point of having long ago done that but recognizing now that you're not doing what you're called to do. Wherever you are in that journey, would you commit to Jesus this moment to do that? Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving each one of us certain gifts, certain talents. Help us now to put those talents to work that area, and let us work in our area of giftedness to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And if, that, if we have yet to take that first step, that man, that woman, that young person has yet to take the first step of asking you in their life, speak to them over the din of my voice that they may do that. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.